This is Judges chapter 3. Joshua and all the elders of his generation have passed away, Judges 2, 7. Yahweh gave Joshua's generation victory in virtually every battle. Then Yahweh gave that generation rest from war, Joshua 11, 23. Yahweh's plan from the beginning was to drive out the inhabitants little by little, generation by generation, until Israel multiplied enough to fill up the land, Exodus 23:30. But also from the beginning, Yahweh said he would bring disasters and defeat on Israel if they forsake him, Leviticus 26, 17. Since Joshua's death, Israel has not been faithful, Judges 2, 13. They've forsaken Yahweh. They're worshiping other gods. The last chapter ended with Yahweh saying, quote, Because this nation has transgressed my covenant, I also will no longer drive out any of the nations. The text then says, quote, So Yahweh left those nations without driving them out hastily. End quote. So Yahweh is leaving open the possibility that Israel might repent, at which time he would resume driving out the other nations. But he's putting Israel on notice don't try to attack anyone right now. I will not give you victory. Now, chapter 3, verse 1. Now these are the nations which Yahweh left to test Israel by them, even as many as had not known all the wars of Canaan, only that the generations of the children of Israel might know to teach them war, at least those who knew nothing of it before. The five lords of the Philistines, all the Canaanites, the Sidonians, and the Hivites who lived on Mount Lebanon, from Mount Baal Hermon to the entrance of Hamath, they were left to test Israel by them to know whether they would listen to Yahweh's commandments, which he commanded their fathers by Moses. The children of Israel lived among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Comment. In verse 1, the present generation in Israel does not have any experience with war. Their parents were warriors, and they had faith in Yahweh. Yahweh gave them victory, and then he gave them a time of peace. And these young adults have been raised in that time of peace, during which Yahweh's hand of protection has been over them. But the present generation is not faithful, so Yahweh has removed his hand of protection. For their own good, they need to learn what it means to be challenged and even oppressed. They need to learn to call on Yahweh and by means of faith wrestle victory from defeat. In verse 2, Yahweh wants to teach them, or as he says in verse 4, he wants to test them, to know whether they would listen to him. Their spiritual growth is stunted, and Yahweh is deliberately putting difficulties in front of them so that hopefully they'll grow up, do the right thing, put off their foreign gods, and cling to Yahweh, Deuteronomy 11.22. So you and I might wonder, how many of our difficulties came from disobedience? Maybe a lot of them. If we are experiencing a trial or a test, God knows about it, he probably even sent it, and we can trust there's a reason for it. James 1, 2 applies, quote, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, end quote. This generation is now going to be tested, which is a gift, because they have a chance to grow up in the faith. Verse 6, they took their daughters to be their wives and gave their own daughters to their sons and served their gods. Comment, the Israelites are intermarrying with the locals, and the locals are idolaters. This practice will inevitably result in Israel adopting the idolatry of their neighbors. Therefore, Yahweh has strictly forbidden Israelites to marry outside the faith, Exodus 34, 16, and Joshua 23, 12. We Christians are free to marry, quote, only in the Lord, 1 Corinthians 7, 39, verse 7. The children of Israel did that which was evil in Yahweh's sight and forgot Yahweh their God and served the Baals and the Asheroth. Therefore Yahweh's anger burned against Israel and he sold them into the hand of Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, and the children of Israel served Cushan Rishathaim eight years. Comment. Yahweh deliberately sent a foreign king to dominate Israel. When it says Israel served him, it means he forced Israel to pay tribute, which is heavy taxes. Yahweh sold them, meaning the Israelites are virtual slaves. The king's location in Hebrew is called Aram Naharim, which indicates upper Mesopotamia or Syrian Mesopotamia to the northeast of Israel. Verse 9. 
When the children of Israel cried to Yahweh, Yahweh raised up a savior to the children of Israel who saved them, even Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. Comment, they cried to Yahweh and he heard them. He sent Othniel to deliver them. The elders who were alive in Joshua's time are all dead, but since Othniel is still alive, now we do find out that some of the younger ones of Joshua's time are still around as more elder people. At least this one is, Othniel was Caleb's nephew. He has experience in war, Judges 1.13. Speaking of Othniel, verse 10, Yahweh's spirit came on him, and he judged Israel, and he went out to war, and Yahweh delivered Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand. His hand prevailed against Cushan Rishathaim. The land had rest forty years, then Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. Comment. Because Israel cried out to Yahweh, Yahweh sent his spirit on Othniel to deliver them. The coming of Yahweh's spirit on someone is an interesting but rare phenomenon in the Old Testament. Yahweh's spirit came on people in the Old Testament, including the 70 elders in the camp, Numbers 11.25, Balaam, Numbers 24.2, Gideon, Judges 6.34, Jephthah, Judges 11.29, Samson, Judges 14.6, Saul, 1 Samuel 10.10, and David, 1 Samuel 16, 13. In each case, the man either prophesied or did some sort of mighty work. By Yahweh's dispirit, Othniel defeated Cushan Rishathaim. There aren't any details about that defeat. It just says, Othniel went out to war and prevailed. Then the land had rest for 40 years. And then, verse 12, the children of Israel again did that which was evil in Yahweh's sight. And Yahweh strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel because they had done that which was evil in Yahweh's sight. Comment, Othniel died, but things got bad again after that. And this will be the pattern, as it said in the last chapter, whenever Yahweh would raise up a judge, quote, Yahweh was with the judge and saved Israel out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. But when the judge was dead, they turned back and dealt more corruptly than their fathers, Judges 2, 18 and 19. So Othniel died, and after that the people relapsed, and Yahweh, quote, strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel. Moab's on the eastern shore of the Dead Sea across the sea from Judah. Speaking of King Eglon, verse 13, he gathered the children of Ammon and Amalek to himself and went and struck Israel, and they possessed the city of palm trees. Comment, King Eglon of Moab recruited his neighbors to the north and east, the Ammonites and Amalekites, and they've crossed over the Jordan and captured the city of palm trees from Israel, which is Jericho or some city near it, Deuteronomy 34, 3. Verse 14, the children of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. Comment again, Israel's paying heavy tribute or taxes to a foreign king. Of course, this is because Eglon is dominating Israel with his military and because Yahweh is strengthening him. Verse 15, but when the children of Israel cried to Yahweh, Yahweh raised up a savior for them, Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjamite, a left-handed man. The children of Israel sent tribute by him to Eglon, the king of Moab. Comment. It makes sense that God would raise up a Benjamite. Anyone, any troops moving from Moab to southern Israel are going to pass through Benjamin. Now regarding this new judge, Ehud, verse 16. Ehud made himself a sword which had two edges, a cubit in length. Comment, that's 18 inches. He made it himself, which was an act of faith. We can see him forging this sword and all along thinking of how he was going to deliver Israel from Moab. No doubt the Moabite coalition has ransacked every home and stolen all the swords and other weapons of war. Still in verse 16, And he wore it under his clothing on his right thigh. He offered the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Comment. In other words, Ehud was an officer in charge of a company of men whose job it was to bring in the tribute to King Eglon, the gold or silver or whatever it was, whatever the tribute was that Eglon required. They brought the tribute to King Eglon in Moab, and still in verse 17, Now Eglon was a very fat man. When he had finished offering the tribute, he sent away the people who carried the tribute, but he himself turned back from the stone idols that were by Gilgal. Comment. In other words, they brought the tribute, then on their way home, they crossed the Jordan River and came to Gilgal. Ehud told his men to go on home, but
But he himself returned to Moab, went back to the king, and said to him, still in verse 19, I have a secret message for you, O king. The king said, Keep silence. All who stood by him left him. Comment, the king sent all his servants out so he could hear Ehud's message in private. What's the message? Verse 20. Ehud came to him, and he was sitting by himself alone in the cool upper room. Ehud said, I have a message from God to you. He arose out of his seat. Ehud put out his left hand and took the sword from his right thigh and thrust it into his body. And the handle also went in after the blade, and the fat closed on the blade, for he didn't draw the sword out of his body, and it came out behind. Comment, there's your message from God. He wants you to have a sword in your abdomen. Verse 23. Then Ehud went out onto the porch and shut the doors of the upper room on him and locked them. Comment, Ehud locked Eglon in the room. Verse 24. After he had gone, his servants came and saw that the doors of the upper room were locked. They said, surely he is covering his feet in the upper room. Comment, that was a literal translation. His servants thought he was covering his feet which seemed to indicate they thought he had locked himself in the room to have a bowel movement. The servants might be smelling the foul odor from the king's injured bowels through the door, and they're embarrassed to disturb him. Verse 25. They waited until they were ashamed, and behold, he didn't open the doors of the upper room. Therefore they took the key and opened them, and behold, their lord had fallen down dead on the floor. Ehud escaped while they waited, passed beyond the stone idols, and escaped to Seirah. Comment, Ehud escaped to Seirah, exact location unknown, but it's past the stone idols that were by Gilgal, meaning he escaped to Ephraim's side of the river. Verse 27, When he had come, he blew a trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim, and the children of Israel went down with him from the hill country, and he led them. He said to them, Follow me, for Yahweh has delivered your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. They followed him and took the fords of the Jordan against the Moabites and didn't allow any man to pass over. Comment, a ford is a shallow area in a river that a man can walk through. It's a strategic point like a bridge. Ehud was able to muster some brave Ephraimites to gather at the ford and take control over it. Remember, the Moabites have taken the city of Palms on Israel's side of the river, and to get home, unless they can swim, they'll have to cross the ford. And if the Moabites want to get revenge and reestablish control over Israel, they'll have to cross the ford from the other direction. So Ehud has positioned himself in a strategic location. Now speaking of Ehud and the Ephraimites, he mustered, verse 29, They struck at that time about 10,000 men of Moab, every strong man and every man of valor. No man escaped. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel. Then the land had rest 80 years. Comment, 80 years of rest. Now this last verse of the chapter coming up tells us everything we know about a judge named Shamgar, verse 31. After him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, who struck 600 men of the Philistines with an ox goad. He also saved Israel. Comment, an ox goad is a sharp instrument like a stick used for poking oxen and making them move. Shamgar used an ox goad to kill 600 Philistines and he probably had to use the ox goad because he didn't have any real weapons because the Philistines had confiscated them. We do know one more thing from Judges 5-6 about this time. During the days of Shamgar, the Israelites avoided the well-traveled roads and took the back roads instead, presumably because the Philistines would rob them on the highways. Yahweh is sending difficulty after difficulty on Israel because they keep forsaking him. The New Testament promises that God will send difficulties on every one of us, every Christian. Hebrews 12, 6, quote, Whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives, end quote. But maybe we can keep our difficulties to a minimum by heeding the commandment of Deuteronomy 4, 9, quote, Only be careful and keep your soul diligently, end quote. If we keep our soul diligently, Hopefully, we won't need that much discipline. And we shouldn't need a judge to keep us in line. We should do that ourselves. That's the chapter. You can find the next one easily at landofhavilah.net, which is Judges 4, Judges 4. This is the map of Judges 3. The first oppressor of Israel was King Cushan Rishathaim of Aram Naharaim. 
that would be upper Mesopotamia, Syrian Mesopotamia in this area northeast of Israel. Othniel went out to war and defeated him. He was the first of twelve judges. Moab was in this area east of the Dead Sea. Moab joined with the Ammonites from this area and the Amalekites from surrounding areas to oppress Israel. And Ehud of Benjamin delivered Israel from them. Benjamin is in this area. Ehud mustered some Ephraimites to take control of the ford, and they killed 10,000 of the enemy. Ephraim is here. Then Shamgar killed 600 Philistines. The Philistines are strongest on the southern coastal plain. Judges 4 is next.